We had two people baptized. We had people, great people joining our church and finish or, finishing orientation. We had some great songs sung, some great prayers that were said. And now it's time to hear from God. Yeah. And so we, we must not stop where we are. Because God wants to go, as Reverend William was here, a little higher. A little higher in himself. And so the scripture that I'll be reading from today is coming from 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. The title that I'm going to use for this sermon in the new series is God's Own People. God's Own People. Right. Coming from 1 Peter chapter 2. Remember we did 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 when we said reflecting the holiness of God. But now as we stand and read God's word, if you understand how to reverence the reading of God's word, please do so. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. And I'll be reading from the King James. And it reads, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as living stone are being built upon a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect the chosen, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed or rejected, the same is made the head of the corner or the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. You may be seated. As you sit down, I will read verses 9 and 10 so you'll know that we are God's own people. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, marvelous light which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Let us pray. Now, Lord God, we thank you through Christ we become your own special people. And Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us now that we would continually show forth praises to your name as we give thanks that you have called us out of darkness and to your marvelous light. Lord, help us not to be disobedient to your word, not to stumble, but to understand it, to apply it in our lives and live holy for you as your own people. Lord, I ask you now to help me decrease that you might increase. And that you would give me strength and help me preach your word with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. That hearts may be touched and lives may be changed. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God's own people. Through Christ, the master builder, we have become God's own people. I'm going to read this introduction so you can see it. And in part of the house of faith, our spiritual house, what we also call the household of faith. That's what we call the household of faith. But Spurgeon says this in his treasury of David. Without God, we are nothing. Great houses have been built, have been erected by ambitious men, but like the baseless fabric of a vision, they pass away, and scarce a stone remains to tell where once they stood. Let me say that again. Spurgeon said, and Spurgeon was a great Baptist preacher in England, in London. And back in the 1800s, he preached to 10,000 people. And he said, without God, we are nothing. Great houses have been built or have been erected by ambitious men. But like the baseless fabric of a vision, 
They passed away, and scarce a stone remains to tell where they once stood. But the psalmist says this, we give you a biblical, biblical illustration. The psalmist says this in Psalm 127, 1a. Except the Lord build the house. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. In other words, if God is not building your lives, if God is not building your family, oh, you can build a family, you can build a relationship, you can build some things, but it has no eternal value. It lacks what it needs to meet you in eternity. You can store it up on earth, but it'll never get past the first atmosphere. Except the Lord build it. Except he build it. In order to understand how we become God's own people, then we must see the picture that Peter saw. He saw Jesus as a living stone. He saw Jesus as a chief cornerstone. And he saw Jesus also as a stumbling stone. If you want to know about how we become God's own people, we must first see Jesus as a living stone. Look at verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. To whom cometh as unto a living stone? You know, here we have what I like to call, and most writers call, but I added my, my own twist to it, a metaphorical paradox. It's a metaphor and a paradox in that statement. The metaphor is this. He says Jesus as, is as a living stone. As, that's a metaphor. But the paradox is this. Or the contradictory, contradictory is this. Stones don't live. They're animated. That's a paradox. You, you, you know, you, you see what he says. He says, as a living stone metaphor. Then a paradox, he says, look, stones, stones don't live. That's a contradictory in our minds. But why? Why didn't he just say Jesus was the living stone? He used a living stone to show us that Jesus has eternal life in himself. Christ as the living stone has eternal life in himself. In John 17, 3, he says this, turn to it and you can see it. What a great picture there that Christ, when he was praying for his own in the garden, he was praying and he says, okay, Father, Turn to it, you there yet? I'm so excited, I, I can't hardly wait for you to get there. <laughs> In John 17, 3, he said, and this is eternal life. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So Peter says, he is a living stone, not a stone of many. He is really the living stone, but Peter wants us to know that he has eternal life in himself. You can turn to John 10, 28, 10, 28. There he says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. But I think one of the best scriptures of all is found in 1 John chapter 5, verses 9. I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. Quite precision. The epistle that John wrote. Are you there yet? There he says, when he talks about Christ having life in himself, he says, and this is the witness that God has given us eternal life, right? And this life is in his son. He that had the son, had the life. He that had not the son of God, has not the life. Because why? Peter wants you to understand that Christ is a living stone and that he has life in himself. He says that's a glorious picture. And that's how you become God's own people when you believe in the one who has the life in himself. I give it to you. You can't win it from me. You can't buy it from me. You can't work hard enough to get it from me. I give it to you. Too many people stumble over 
with that. So Peter said, you see the picture now? You can only become a living stone if you believe in the living stone. Hmm. You see? Now that makes us a part of the what? The paradox. We are living stones in the living stone who has eternal life in himself. Have you ever thought about that? That Jesus Christ can make such a bold statement that I can give you life and nobody can keep me from giving you life? If Christ can give you life, what else can he give you? <coughs> can he give you peace in, 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 what, in the midst of all your storms? Can he give you stability in a chaotic world? Can he give you comfort when you can't even comfort yourself? And you know something about the peace of God, it truly passes your imagination, your mind. You've seen people who lost a loved one. And you say, how can they have so much peace? That's God's peace that suppresses our thinking. Our mind. That's how good God is. Why? Because Christ has eternal life in himself. Because he is the living stone. The Jews knew what he was talking about because the Jews understood that the building that they erected was what? Had this one stone that held it all together. And they put it on top of that stone. And they built all the buildings on top of that stone. And they said, that is the living stone. The building was the living itself. But they said, look, the building is held together by that stone. The question I must ask you, What's holding you together? Is it your job holding you together? We'll get to that. Not only is Christ a living stone because he has eternal life in himself, but he has eternal permanence in himself. It's not enough to say that you can give me eternal life. But Christ says, I can keep you right, right up where I gave you. I can keep you. The same scripture, John 10, 28. I give unto them eternal life, and neither shall they perish, and no man shall pluck them out of my hand. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun in the work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. And it was so great that Paul understood the permanence of what? This eternal life that he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, but I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he's able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. But that's not enough. Jesus closed it out and slammed the door on all those people who say we can lose our salvation. In John 10, 29, he says, my father who gave you to me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck you out of my father's hand. Peter wanted you to know that Christ has eternal life in himself and he also has eternal permanence in himself. If God gave you eternal life, then you have eternal life. And how long is eternity? I don't know, but when you get there, let me know. <laughs> I'll be right behind you. I just know it's a long time. I just know it's forever. I just know it's from everlasting to everlasting. I don't care what people told you. I don't care how you say the devil made me do this, the devil made me do that. If you in Christ Jesus, he can keep you from some things. Joe, so I'm going to start right here and pity pat on the devil a little bit. That devil. He always telling me to do something. You quit lying on Satan. <laughs> he never told you. You did it. You wanted to do it. Because it felt good. It appealed to you. The devil can't make you sin, but all he can do is tempt you to sin. You sin when you get into it. Why? Because it feels good. Looks good. Tastes good. I told you that, that little, that little, uh, 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 little uh, illustration I gave you guys about the devil in the church. And he's on the steps. 
and, and, the, and the lady came up and said, Mr. Devil, what you doing here? Because he was crying, just crying. Mr. Devil, what you doing outside on the church steps? He said, because all those people in there are always lying on me. <laughs> <laughs> always lying on Satan. You forget who Jesus Christ is. He didn't save you to let you just keep falling and falling and falling into sin. He saved you so that you might become his own people. Quit lying on the devil. Tell the truth. The truth shall set you free. And there's nothing like being set free when you tell the truth and then let the Spirit of God convict you and go ahead and leave. Go ahead and leave. Amen. What a great picture he says here in 2 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. Hope you guys stay there. He said, Reverend Ford, you've been going through too many scriptures for us to stay there. Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. Chosen of God. This same Jesus whom we serve has eternal life in himself and eternal purpose in himself. And we can't blame anybody when we do wrong because Christ has given us all that we need to live right. To live right. And I want to encourage you today. You are a living stone now. Then we should live holy for Christ. Amen. You're not your own. You're bought with the price. You're God's own people. Not only do we see Christ as a living stone, but we also see Christ in verse 6 as the chief cornerstone. Wherefore it is contained in the what? In the scripture. That I lay in Zion a what? Chief cornerstone. Elect, chosen, precious, and he that believes on him should not be ashamed. That was first mentioned in, in Psalm chapter, Psalm 118, verse 22. That's the first mention. Turn to it. This is a Bible study <coughs> sermon. Stay close so you don't lose your way. You know that how you become God's own special people. Look at Psalm 118, verse 22. Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the what? Corner. Or the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord doing, verse 23 said, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This stone. This chief cornerstone. He's a chief cornerstone. Not only is a chief cornerstone, but he's a sure foundation. Turn to Isaiah 26, 28, 16. He's a sure foundation. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation. A stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Peter gives us a picture of Christ as the chief cornerstone because he's a sure foundation. I don't know about you, but, but I wanted to build my family on Christ. I don't know about you, but I wanted to build my hopes and dreams on Christ. I don't know about you, but I wanted to build all that I had on Christ. My marriage, everything I had, I want to build on Christ because he's my sure foundation because he's the chief cornerstone. And the cornerstone was placed in the building by the architects in those days in the corner. And every other stone was held together by that stone. And that's when the Jews knew what Peter was talking about when Peter said, Jesus Christ is a chief cornerstone. In other words, he's your sure foundation. What are you building your lives upon today? Oh, I know it. You work at USA. Uh -oh. <laughs> and as and, and long as USA is there, you're living. Newsflash. I used to work at USA. And they fired a plenty of people who built their life 
upon the USA. You need a sure foundation. I don't care how well they pay you. Oh man, I love those bonuses at USA. And I love everything they gave me. But but when but when I got sick, I didn't see Bob Davis or General Rollins coming to visit me in the hospital. When I got sick, I didn't call upon Bob Davis or General Rollins to, to, to pray for him and say, can you deliver me from what I'm going through? When I got sick, I called on my sure foundation. I called on Jesus Christ and he heard my God and he delivered me by and by. You need a sure foundation. You need that chief cornerstone. You need Jesus. When you're going through a bad divorce, and it seems like nobody cares, you have to have a chief cornerstone and a sure foundation that you can watch, depend on because the storms of life are going to come and they're going to blow and they're going to blow. But if you have a sure foundation, come what may. Come what may. I got Jesus Christ. You're going to lose the loved one. But come what may, I have Jesus Christ. I have this sure foundation and it's blowing in my life, but yet I'm still here. You shook me, but you couldn't shake my foundation. Oh, I almost gave up. Oh, I almost fell down. Oh, I almost, I almost. But my foundation kept me here. He's sure. He's steadfast. He's immovable. My foundation is sure. You can build yours upon the sand. But I like this nursery rhyme. You remember the three little pigs? It's a great illustration. One little pig built his house on straw. And the big boy wolf came and said, big bad wolf came and said, little pig, little pig, let me in. Now I gotta have my chitty chin chin. I'm a huff, and I'm a puff, and I'm a huff and puff, and I'm gonna blow your house down. And he huffed and puffed, and he blew his house down and ate the little pig. He, he had his house on, on the wrong foundation. Then he went to the second little pig. He built his house and put sticks. And he said, I'm, I'm a huff. No, first he knocked on the door. Little pig, little pig, let me in. No, not about to have my chin chin chin. Then I'm a huff, and I'm a puff, and huff, and puff, and blow your house down. And he huffed, and he puffed, and he huffed, and he blew his house down, and ate him up. Because his, his foundation. Somebody said, that's not right, but that's what the nursery rhyme said. But when I read, he didn't get no chance. The pig didn't get a chance. Now the one I had, he became, he became uh, a Stanley barbecue. <laughs> now that's the best around I read. I just read it on the internet, man. Somebody been talking to those guys on the internet. <laughs> I know they ran, I know they ran to the other pig's house and went in. But this person said, no, 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 no. He ate him up. I thought that would be better for you. <laughs> But he was smart. He built his house upon bricks. And he knocked on the door and said, Little pig, little pig, let me in. Now I'm not about to have my chinny chin chin. I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow your house down. And he huffed and he puffed and he puffed and he huffed and he huffed and he puffed and he couldn't blow his house down. Why? Because he had built his house upon a sure foundation. Satan can huff and he can puff, but when your house is built for Jesus Christ, he'll never blow your foundation down. Never blow it down. I'm sorry. Y'all still think about barbecue. It's not time to eat. <laughs> Christ is a sure foundation. And so that's why he's the chief cornerstone, because it's a sure foundation. But also because he's the bond of consistency. He's a bond of consistency. He, he consistently holds your life together. The fabric of your life can really tear as we go through the trials and tribulations of life. The fabric of your life can really tear as we go through disappointments and depression. The fabric of your life can really tear as we get caught up in all types of habits. Whether it be drugs or alcohol, whatever it may be, lying and stealing, the fabric of our life can really step, tear, but Christ holds it all together. He's the bond of consistency. Colossians 1.17 says, and he's, and he's 
before all things, and in him all things consist, or all things are held together. He holds it together by the power of his might. So when you're going through some trials and tribulations, know that you have a bond of consistency, and he'll hold your life together. When that child is not doing good, and they're going crazy, guess what Jesus Christ said? I hold it together for you. You train him up, and Jesus said, why? I keep him. Is a bond of consistency. And don't we need some consistency in our lives? Yeah. When, when people we, we thought was consistent, now they don't do right, we need to know that we have somebody who what? Who holds it all together. That chief cornerstone held that building together and it was consistently held together and God consistently holds your life together. Yeah. If it wasn't for the Lord, on our side, where would we be? If God wasn't on your side, where would you be? God is holding it together. You lose that loved one, God holds it together. You go through a divorce, God holds it together. When you lose your God, job, God holds it together. When you get into debt because somebody got sick, God holds it together. When all your friends turn their back on you, God consistently, through Christ, holds it all together. Holds it together. I like that. Because I don't have my life together like I think I could. But Christ still keeps me. He's consistent. He consistently blesses us. Even when we don't deserve it. And I was thankful this morning that God consistently blessed grace. Because I told my wife when I came, I said, I hope they, they forgot to turn their clocks back. So they'll come to church thinking it's 930. But it's really Sunday school time. So we have a lot of people in Sunday school. And guess what happened? God was very, very consistent. And some of y'all came thinking it was 9.30, but it was Sunday school. And we had a lot of people in Sunday school. That ought to be the norm and not the exception. I just thought I'd throw a plug in for Sunday school, amen? Eh? But, but he's, our, he's our chief cornerstone because he's a bond of consistency. How many of you have some friends, and just wave your hand, you don't have to put them up real high, that let you down in your life? I, I, I raise my hand because I know someone joking. Let me know. Joker. They still my friends now. Joker. I call them jokers because they're my friends. Uh -oh. But they let me down a lot. But I know a friend that's sticking closer than a brother and he's very consistent in his character and he'll never leave me, not forsake me. No matter what I'm going through, no matter how bad I've been, God keeps on blessing me, keeps on forgiving me because he's consistent. as our chief cornerstone. God wants to be consistent in your life. But somebody's here today who don't know Christ. And so you have a lot of inconsistencies in your life. Your life is totally inconsistent. You're here, there a little bit, here, there a little bit. But God wants you to be what? Consistent with him because he's always consistent in your life. I don't know the last time I didn't have anything to eat on my table. I, I'm trying to figure out the last time I didn't have something to eat. See that the more I give away, God consistently bless me with more. And the more I give away, God gives me more. And the more I give away, God gives me more. And when I need something, God is right on time. So Peter said, look, he is a chief cornerstone. And even though men may reject him, God chose him. God made him precious. But what gives him the right to be this chief cornerstone? What gives him the right to be a sure foundation? And what gives him the right to be our bond of consistency? Turn to Isaiah 28, 16. I'm going to tell you what gives the right. We're going to go right back there again. The depth of the scriptures. This is what got me when I, when I pondered on it last night. And I thought about it in my night visions upon my bed. When I should have been asleep, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me. Therefore, Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus said the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tri stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Hold your finger right there. Now go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. Right where we were. Peter says in verse 6, 
Wherefore I lay in Zion, wherefore it's contained in the scriptures, behold I lay in Zion and chief cornerstone. Elect. That gives him the right right there because he's elect by God and chosen by God. That gives him the right, right? He's precious inside of God, right? That gives him the right. But Isaiah says he's a tried stone. He's a tried stone. You know what Isaiah meant when he said he's a tried stone? He said when Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he was tested and tried, and Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, he was tested and tried. When Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, not my will, but thine will be done. He was tested and tried. And when he was on the cross, and they said to him, he saved others. You remember? Let him come down from the cross and say to himself, we'll bleed him. He said, Father, forgive them not. For, for they know not what to do. But into thy hands I commend my spirit. He was tested and tried. He wasn't tempted to sin. He could sin. He was tempted to show you that he couldn't sin. Amen. He was tested and tried. And since he's tested and tried, don't you think he can hold all our little insignificant, yet significant problems together? He knows what you're going through. He's been tested. You said you lost a loved one? Well, he had a stepfather who wasn't around anymore, so Joseph probably died, so he's been tested. You say he lost a friend? He said, my own familiar fear and friend has lifted up his heel against me. He's been tied, tried, and tested. He's a tried stone. The stone that becomes the chief cornerstone has to be what? Shaped the right way. And you can't be shaken the right way until you go through the fire of the life. And Jesus Christ went through it. And he was shaken the right way. And when the father saw that he was shaken the right way, he said, ah, oh, that's my son in whom I'm well pleased. And he took the cornerstone and he said, he has to be the cornerstone of your life. And the Christ is the cornerstone of your life. Amen. If he's the cornerstone of your life, no matter what you're going through, he's been tried and tested. And you say, I don't have money. The cattle on a thousand hills is his. Hills is his. He's been tried and tested. Amen. And you say, I don't have a husband. But God told Israel, I'll be your husband. He's been tried and tested. Yes, sir. Do you understand? Yes. Nothing that you can go through that Christ don't know about. That gives him the right to be the chief cornerstone. That gives him the right to be the sure foundation. That gives him the right to be the bond of consistency in your life because he's been tried. I must ask this question. And you may answer it tomorrow. Hmm. Have you been weighed in the balances and found wanting? Because we're not what? Living and patterning our lives after the chief cornerstone who holds us together. If he's the living stone, then we're living stones. And finally, Peter sees him in verse 8 as a stumbling stone. Look at it. We close this out. As a stumbling stone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble out the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. They rejected. The word of God through their disobedience. That's why he became a stumbling stone to them. They rejected the written word. Notice what he says in verse 6. It is contained in the scriptures. In Romans 10, 11, he says, wherefore he said, it is contained in the scriptures. In Romans 9, 33, he says there, it is contained in the scriptures. In Acts 4, 11, he said it's contained in the scriptures. Isaiah said it is contained in the scriptures. The psalmist said in Psalm 118.22 again, it is contained in the scriptures. They rejected the written word of God. And so they stumbled. It's contained in the scriptures. All scriptures get my inspiration of God. It is contained in the scriptures. And so they stumbled and said, at the word, the word, the written word became a stumbling stone. Oh, but more so than that, the living word, the logos, the word incarnate became a stumbling word because they couldn't believe the Jews that Jesus Christ 
was the way, the truth, and the life. The only way, the only truth, and the only life. It's like a drunk man who's been drinking for a good while. And you tell him, hey, don't walk down there. There's some uneven ground. There's some, some roots and stuff there. You better be careful. You might stumble and fall. But because he's drunk and he's influenced by some other thing, he walks and stumbles and falls to his own hurt. How many of us are drunk off the allures of the world? How many of us are drunk because we want to be like somebody else. How many of us are drunk? Because you told it you should always be the head and nothing should ever happen to you. How many of us are drunk off the cares of the world and what happened? We stumble over Jesus Christ and we fall to our own destruction. We fall to our own destruction. You mean to tell me this cop and his son He's the Messiah. They, they couldn't find him. It, it blew their mind. And they stumbled over it. And people today are stumbling over Christ. Even in this church right now, there's somebody in this church who don't know Christ, but you've been stumbling and bumbling. And you know what? Tomorrow might be your last day, and you'll fall deep down into your own destruction. Matter of fact, if you plan a game or not, you know what they tell you? You just go on, pass it on, go straight to jail. Mm. That's what happen when we die without Christ. There's only one place we can go. There's no, that, when you die, there's no reprieve. You don't get a second chance when you die. You have to choose Christ now. But they stumbled over. They stumbled at the written word. They stumbled over the logos, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us for a little while. Look, if you stumble at the written word, it tells you what to believe. If you stumble over the logos, the word that became carnal, he died so that you can believe in him. If you stumble over all those things, you also stumble at the love of God. At the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave. You know, the Jews thought, they thought they could take God's love and put it in a laboratory and measure it. Based on what they did and how they did it. But Paul told the Ephesians, the love of God surpasses all knowledge. Paul says, you know what? You can't measure God's love. It's too immense. You can't measure love, God's love. They thought the love of God was just for Jews. They knew Gentiles could be saved, but it couldn't be brought into the body of Christ. And no, God said, no, Jews and Gentiles are one in me. They missed what? They stumbled over his love. Because God's love is in from eternity past. And God's love is to eternity future. So God's love is from eternity to eternity, and you can't measure that because it'll blow your mind. They stumbled over the love of God. He won't love you Gentiles like he loved us. Peter says, Christ the living stone has made you living stone. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your color is. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care your own funny ways. God can do something in your life and make you a part of this household of faith and make you his own people. How many people have felt the love of God and kept on moving? Kept on moving. Kept on disbelieving. Kept on running. When God wants to be your all in all. When God wants to keep you, when God wants to love you and manifest his love for you, they missed it. They tried to measure on based on what they did, but they needed to experience God's love. People, you need to come to Christ so you can experience God's love. Oh, what a great love it is. I once was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Sinking, sinking deep within, never to be heard from anymore. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, not safe. Safe am I. He lifted me out of my sins. He lifted me up, and I experienced the depth of his love. How deep is his love? I don't know, but I want to go there. I want to experience it more and more in my life. You can't do that until he becomes your savior. Your mother loves you. 
but it's different from God's deep love. Oh, your father loves you. Oh, but it can't compare to the love of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, I love my children, but they can't experience the love that God has until they become one with him in Christ. We see this great picture of a living stone who makes us living stones in himself. We see this great picture of the chief cornerstone. He holds us all together. But we also see that he's a stumbling stone. Because of the disobedience, there was a point in there too. Don't be disobedient today. Christ wants to be yours. And he wants you to be his. Because Christ exists, we can exist in Christ. Paul puts it this way. I am crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lived in me, and this life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ died so that you might live and become God's own people. I don't know about you, but I want to know more about his love. And you may be here today and you may be thinking to yourself, I'm too wretched for Christ to die for me. I'm too miserable for Christ to die for me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I was. You don't know how bad I am. Though your sins are like scar, he can wash them white as snow. Why? It's the blood. It's the blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. God is working on a building. It's a sure foundation. And if you see that I'm crying, I'm not crying because I'm just crying. I'm crying because God is building me up, making me into something, turning me into somebody so that I can glorify his son. God is working on that building. And I'm going to work along with you. Don't you want to work? But you must first, if you haven't accepted Christ, let him come and work in your life. So as the sanctuary choir prepares to sing, the Spirit of God is tugging them. This living